Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Extractions and Aya. So in this video we're generating hydrogen sulfide and it was in the middle of another future video but I thought it was interesting enough and that other video was getting very long so I've taken this section out and made it its own video. Hydrogen sulfide does appear in amateur labs. I mean, sometimes it's a reducing gas, which isn't all that common, but generally if you want a reducing gas, you use hydrogen because then you don't have to deal with sulfur compounds. But where hydrogen sulfide is particularly useful is um, most heavy metal sulfides are very, very insoluble. So if you want to precipitate out heavy metals from a solution, you can use hydrogen sulfide into the solution and that will precipitate out. It's not a great gas to use because it is actually quite toxic. It's similar in toxicity to carbon monoxide and I believe it's roughly the same mechanism, well, sort of the same result as to why uh, it's toxic. If you have too large an amount that you breathe in, you will suffocate and that's not because there's no oxygen available in the air to breathe, it's because uh, it interferes with your body's ability to transport that oxygen from your lungs to the rest of your body. Hydrogen sulfide is of course notable for its smell and that's just because it's a biological molecule. So it's it's sort of available in our environment and is a sign of decay. So your, your body has a real interest in, in picking it up. So we've developed a very, very acute sense of smell for it. The level at which most people can start to detect a smell of hydrogen sulfide is half a part per billion. That's 500 parts per trillion. It's a very, very small concentration at which you can start smelling this gas. The good news is because it's a biological molecule, even though you can detect it at that, uh, you know, 500 parts per trillion, it's not really that dangerous to you at that level uh, because your body has developed mechanisms to be able to cope with it. The very important catch there, and this is a very important thing to know if you're ever going to work with hydrogen sulfide, is that above a certain level, your sense of smell becomes deadened. It, it overwhelms your smell and you stop smelling it altogether. You stop smelling anything. What will happen is that you'll have a smell that builds up in concentration and then suddenly disappears and you can think, oh good, the gas has gone away. But in fact, the gas levels have gone up to the point where it's overwhelmed your sense of smell and now that's at very frighteningly dangerous levels. Things that interrupt your breathing will render you unconscious and then you're lying on the ground where the heavier gas will pull and you'll die. All right, so today we're looking at an alternative way of generating hydrogen sulfide. And why do we want an alternative way? Well, the general way for someone like me in an amateur lab to generate hydrogen sulfide is to react uh, a reactive metal such as aluminium with sulfur. It'll make aluminium sulfide. I can take that aluminium sulfide and react it with an acid and that will produce hydrogen sulfide. When you go out to do it, it's always a little bit of a pain. But if you use very finely powdered aluminium with the sulfur, the reaction takes off quite a bit and you don't end up with any product left over. But if you try and slow that reaction down, and here I'm using some steel wool in with the reaction as well to try and slow it down, then it doesn't really go to completion very well. All right, there's the flames. That was okay. And even if you do it perfectly, you are gonna get these awkward chunks of sulfide that you have to store somewhere and they always generate hydrogen sulfide onto contact with the air and get worse over time. So every time I've needed hydrogen sulfide, I've had to remake that aluminium or iron sulfide again, because even if I try and store it really well, the aluminium sulfide just degrades over time and is no good the next time I go to use it. But I have come across a different way of generating hydrogen sulfide, and that's by reacting paraffin wax with sulfur. The molten sulfur and molten paraffin wax generates hydrogen sulfide, but because that's a sort of a thick, viscous mix, um, it doesn't generate the gas very well, so they tried adding in different uh, materials to just give the gas something to nucleate around. What we're going to be using is sulfur, paraffin, and just carbon. For our source of sulfur, we just have sulfur. Buy it at the hardware store as sulfur. In our source of paraffin wax, we have this blue candle here, which, um, you know, is blue. Uh, and then we want something for the gas to nucleate around, something porous. So I have, um, you know, some old charcoal, a willow. Uh, that I was going to use to make black powder at some point, probably fucking 10 years ago at this point. Yeah, I, I don't know what else I need. Fucking Eye of Newt. Like, this doesn't feel like real chemistry. This feels like potion making in a video game. Oh, I'm going to combine the candle with the burnt twig. Yeah, that's the science that we have planned here today. 
Apparently the ratios are two to one of uh, candle <laughs> to sulfur. It's parts, which you know is usually an indication that it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Twice as much fucking wax to to you know sulfur. Like whatever. I'm sure it doesn't fucking matter. This is this isn't real science. This isn't real science. I'm just gonna fucking hammer up a candle now. For, it's not real science. Let's go over the setup. So we have here our paraffin and sulfur and charcoal mix in that pot there, which is getting heated by the heating mantle when I turn it on. And then that comes up to one of my favorite glass for pieces, the Klyzan adapter. Just a fantastic bit of glassware. We've got an inlet here that's running from an air pump. So we're just pumping air through the system rather than relying on the vapor pressure of the, or like the gas generation pressure of the hydrogen sulfide as a generator to like bubble through a solution. If we just have a steady stream of carrier gas, which in this case is just air, and then any hydrogen sulfide that's generated will, um, you know, get carried through the system. And that's a way of just sort of smoothing out the generation of the gas. Every time I do gas generators now, I, I tend to use a carrier gas like air or I've still got an argon cylinder sitting over there looking at me, wondering when I'm going to use it next. At some point. It's just so much better because the gas generation is never constant. So you always get like sack back and issues and issues with pressure and, and yeah. So if you just have a carry gas, it's much nicer. I'm going to interrupt it here because I'm not sure I really agree with what I'm doing here. And that's because it's easy to forget that hydrogen sulfide is a flammable gas. Usually when you generate a flammable gas such as this and you're using its own sort of generation pressure to push it through the system, then you're above its explosive flammability limit. Because you don't have any oxygen in the system or any air in the system, the mixture in there can't burn or explode. To contrast that with what I'm doing here where I'm pumping air into the system to push out the flammable gas. So we kind of got an ideal mixture. I'm not sure it's ideal, but we've got a mixture of air and flammable gas within the system at all times. In saying that, I am pushing a lot of air in and not generating a large amount of gas all the time. So potentially I've got so much air that I've diluted my flammable gas below a few percent so I don't run the risk of fire anyway. I don't know, what do you think? Am I overthinking it or I don't think I'm overthinking it. Using air to, to push through a flammable gas does seem a little dodgy and when I do this next I'm going to be using argon to um, pump the hydrogen sulfide through and I think that's a better thing to do with all flammable gases. Just because you've done it once and it was completely fine doesn't mean it's completely safe. It's always good to look back on things and think how can I do it safer the next time even though there wasn't an incident. I don't know. But um, We're coming up to this uh, fractionating column which is really just we're using as an air condenser here um, because we're going to be running at well, about 300 degrees, I would think. It's not quite the boiling point of sulfur, which is like 450 odd, but um, the sulfur will have reasonable vapor pressure at this temperature, so we don't want um, any sulfur ending up in our reaction mix. So we want to strip the sulfur out of the gas stream and cool down the gas. So we've just got like a, an air condenser here. Yeah, it comes up, a bit of tubing, comes down and goes into our solution. So yeah, we're not scrubbing the gas or anything at the moment. Uh, that's just water, um, but I'll grab some bleach solution, which will destroy the hydrogen sulfide if we need it. Should be all right. Um, let's get a heating and see if we actually generate any hydrogen sulfide or what other monstrosities await us. All right, it's actually generating gas pressure on its own. Look at that, look at it go. That's probably hydrogen sulfide. All right, we should test for the presence of hydrogen sulfide, and we can do that using lead. So um, I think I've got some lead nitrate paper around. I'm picking up a bit of a smell, but um, that's obviously not gonna come through on camera. And it's um, obviously not very healthy, so I might actually turn this down and, um, all right. It's, um, all right. It's, okay.
So what we're looking for with this reaction to make it sort of stand out above the other traditional way of making hydrogen sulfide at home, which is the aluminium sulfide uh, and acid, is um, our way to sort of turn off the hydrogen sulfide generation. If we've got too much, we can just say, no, no, I don't need any more, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it. For this, it's, it's removing the heat source, letting it cool, and that should stop the hydrogen sulfide generation. I mean, it, it should, but it might not because you know, once we've started the reaction, it could be generating a bit of heat, so it could just keep going, keep going, in which case you know, this, this method isn't very good at all because you can't really uh, yeah, just stop the generation of hydrogen sulfide, which is bad. So that's obviously why I put the, the jack there, was that I could drop the heat. We'll just let this cool down for 10 minutes or so, just let it think about it, and then um, we'll get back to it. There's a lot of sulfur in this uh, condenser, you know, even in this tubing, even in here, you know, and some was in the reaction mix before I added the bleach as well. So, so the sulfur is quite volatile, um, you know, and that would have contaminated any reaction mix that we, we had here. And that's also going to be a bit of a bitch to clean all this in here. That's not even mentioning what horrors await me for cleaning of this thing. Unsure about this method, but it seems, you know, it's... At least it generates hydrogen sulfide pretty readily. Um, it caught me off guard. Just all of a sudden it started generating it. I was hoping it would slowly generate it and then, you know, get picked up by the carrier gas. But no, it was, it was really starting to pump it out. So, um, you know, I was surprised by how much it actually generated here. But um, ah, I was prepared. All right, so here I am again. Um, we've done the reaction. Surprise, I've, you know, filmed this after I filmed the rest of the stuff. But anyway, I thought it went really well. There's a couple of positives in here which could be useful. An advantage is the fact that the gas comes out anhydrous, I suppose, well, pretty mostly anhydrous, much better than the other, the aluminum sulfide plus acid because that's gonna boil off water and acid vapors. There's no source of oxygen in, in this at all, so you can't generate any water. So that's potentially a good advantage. The biggest advantage for me is the fact that this can be turned on and off um, just by, by heating. So I've used this three or four times now on different days to generate hydrogen sulfide. And each time, every time it gets molten, it starts producing hydrogen sulfide again, it cools off relatively quickly, um, and then it stops generating hydrogen sulfide. And I can just put a stopper in it, and this doesn't generate hydrogen sulfide at room temperature. So it doesn't sit here generating an atmosphere in the flask, which, you know, then blows the stopper out or anything like that. It's just inert at room temperature. I'm not sure if this is an advantage or disadvantage, but you could definitely tell in this video, I get a little bit overwhelmed. It uh, starts generating the hydrogen sulfide a lot quicker than I, I thought it would uh, when the first time it's used, um, you know, because the stuff isn't mixed very well. Um, it doesn't generate a lot until it's molten. And then all of a sudden it starts generating quite a bit. Um, I was caught a little bit off guard because I was just trying to film the stuff. And then all of a sudden it started generating a lot of gas. <laughs> um, and in conclusion, the, the blast disadvantage is, uh, is this may have permanently fucked this flask. So in this last part of the video, I will attempt to clean this flask. <laughs> just using water. Let's see how far we get. <laughs> like some toluene or xylene or something on this to get the sulfur and the charcoal out that's stuck in there or maybe it's just a piranha job maybe i could just chuck piranha solution in it either way it's a bit dramatic just another day of work that i have to do to recover this flask and <laughs> i'm not rich enough to chuck it in the bin so whoa or i could accidentally drop it and just smash it but ah, i'll do it another day i'll do it another day i swear Hopefully this hydrogen sulfide works for what I need it for. All right, no worries. Um, oh, shit, 